So here we are with our first question and answer video during the Dory series. Now, we've got a number of questions here, quite a few of them about the Dory and questions about other things as well. So, uh, you know, uh, the other thing I want to say before I get started here is these questions and the comments that people have been sending in, the reading of them for me is just fantastic. I mean, it's inspired me. I mean, people say that I've inspired them, and I, I'm sure I have, but uh, it's really inspired me. Like, it's really made it happen for me in a big, big way. I don't think if I got that much comments and all the positive uh, feedback from the whole thing that I'd probably still be doing it. But at this point, there's no stopping, and uh, it's really fun. So uh, what I want to do is get into these questions right away. And uh, the first question right here is from Travis Shepard. And... Uh, He's got a few questions here, but I'm only going to address one part of it. It says, uh, will the dory be a rowboat or have a motor? Well, primarily, it's going to be a rowboat, basically. And uh, I would say that this size dory is usually built uh, as a rowboat for tendon purposes, probably, or sport purposes, or, or rough water rowing. But it really has no uh, you know, commercial fishing purpose or anything like that. It's really a dory uh, that's made for rowing, but don't be surprised if I put a little outboard well in it as well, and also a sailing rig. So it's probably going to be a rowboat, and a motorboat, and a sailboat. So uh, the next question I have here is from Jose, and he says, Love your videos, very captivating and informative. The one question I have is, what career path led you to where you are today? Well, I'd say that the career path that kind of led me into it really was fishing. My father was a fisherman. And we started working on wooden boats because he had wooden fishing boats. And uh, on top of that, I just have to say that the next career path was shipwriting itself because I got into shipwriting and uh, I enjoyed it so much and I was capable of doing it and that really made me stick there. It wasn't fishing that made me stay there, but I think fishing got me going and then the trade itself just kept me there. So that's pretty much it. Our next question here is from Stanley. When you're fairing the stations to hold the plank and flat, do you end up chasing your tail? In other words, once you fair one station, then you fair the next station, does the second station throw the first station out of plane? Well, in the first place, I don't have a tail, so I can't chase it around the boat, but uh, you're right in some extent. You can't just do all the fairing on one station and then move to the next one and fair the next one because the first one could be out. So what you do is make sure that you fair the station down conservatively. You don't take enough off the station. What you do is you, you know you have to take some off of one side, so you take some off that side and protect that black line on the other side. Go to the next station and fair that and then go back to that one. But Chasing your tail would, to me, would be like making mistakes on the thing. We don't have to do that, but we do have to go back and forth. From Music Searcher, great series. I've got a lot of questions, but what makes it a dory or a skiff or a launch? Well, I guess it comes from different terms that have been used in the past, pretty much. A dory, as far as I know, was a, a French fishing boat that was used on the banks years and years ago, so it came from Europe. But... Uh, the term skiff is really a small boat that's used to tend a bigger boat, usually. Now, it doesn't mean that a skiff has got a flat bottom. A skiff could be a round bilge boat. A skiff kind of refers to the usage of the boat, pretty much, and a dory kind of does do. The dories were designed originally to be work boats and to carry a load. And then they kind of morphed into boats like this, which were uh, carried lesser of a load, but were more stable and rode better, the Swampskit style dories. So maybe that does it for you right there. The next question here is from Ron Carson. Is it possible to get a vocabulary reference, maybe at the end or beginning, of different terminology you'll use in the video? For example, what is the shear plank? Well, the shear plank is the plank at the top of the boat. Now, this is upside down right now, but the shear plank would be the plank that goes on right here, and it'd be covered up by the guard, and then it becomes broad strakes, and the garboard plank would be up against the bottom. On a round bilge boat, the garboard plank is the one next to the keel. And, you know, all the parts of this boat aren't on here right now, but as I put them on, I'll describe them. The transom would be back aft. It's kind of a flat piece, and then we've got the stem up forward. And uh, like I say, you're going to have frames and just all kinds of parts, gunnels and seats and different things. And, uh, you know, you can get uh, 
nautical dictionary. I mean, I sat in front of a nautical dictionary half of my life looking up all of these things, and it's actually fun. So uh, that'll work, and I think the internet could answer some of that too. But like I said, I'm going to do the best I can to answer some of this stuff as I go along. Now, the next question I've got here is from J.L. Webuser. Webuser. <laughs> Fantastic videos. Question. How do you know the location to attach the upper cross member to the molds? Is it identified on the plans? Well, I identified it on the plans. Now, he called it an upper cross member. I call it a cross spall. Here it is going right across this section right here. And I have it in line with the shear of the boat right here at section number three. And what I've done is I've identified that on the drawings and I've transferred that to the other sections and put the cross balls on the same height on every section so they would stack up along this strong back and be in the correct relationship to each other. So that's how I did it. I lined it up. All the tops are lined up with the shear at station number three. Now I've got another one here from Hand Grips Rays. Great video as always. I love what you do. What made you choose a dory for your personal boat to build? Why was the dory what you wanted? What kind of draft will it have? Well, I'll tell you what made me choose a dory for my next build was because I wanted to use one. I wanted to use one this size. I didn't want a bigger dory than this. I didn't really want a smaller dory than this. I had a dory about this size when I was a kid, and I just had a ball in it. And believe me, there's no other boat to be in when you're out in rough water. And uh, I wanted a boat that I could bail easy. You know, that wasn't a funny shape in the bottom, that has a flat bottom so you can skid a bailing box across the bottom and bail it out should you get water in it, especially sailing it. You know, because once you get water in a boat like this sailing it, usually you dump the wind out of the sail and the boat stands up and you can bail it very easily if you've got a flat bottom without any frames in the way. Now, most of the dories that I used to have and the most of the dories I've seen have frames going across the bottom and uh, so you kind of have to pick a spot to bail, but this one's not going to have any frames going across the bottom, so I'll be able to bail it real easy. I like the fact that it doesn't have a keel in it, that when it sits on the beach and it's got a rocker in it that you can spin the boat around. I like the fact that uh, it's got a rocker in it again so that you can keep it on course in heavy water because waves will knock you off course a little bit and you don't want to have it take four or five strokes to get yourself lined up with the next big one coming. You want to make one or two strokes, get the boat lined up again for what's coming at you and take it. Now, you know, I've experienced these boats. I don't want to row another type of boat and I'll tell you for sure that I don't think I could have uh, died off without experience and a dory like this again. These are the most fun boats I've ever been in and uh, I love rowing, so that's what made me pick this one. Now here's a question from Christopher Bailey, and it's about the skiff, or about the bottom planking on a skiff. It says here, Hi Louie, loving the videos. I want to build a work skiff as in Series 1. I'm wondering if pine is okay to use as Douglas fir and cedar are expensive here in UK. Could you discuss the different types of pine softwood that could be used? All the best, Chris. Well, really, building a work skiff like that, you can use all kinds of different materials. Uh, you can use pine for the bottom of a boat like that, but if you slab saw on it, if it's slab sawn, it's got a chance of cupping and curling on you and different things like that, and moving a lot when it dries out and swells up. So, you know, if you're going to put pine on a boat like that, you're better off with quarter sawn pine or edge grain material. Well, no matter what it is, you're better off with edge grain material. You know, I've seen some pine bottoms that were made of hard yellow pine that were even superior to the, uh, to the fir bottoms. So you can use all kinds of pine. We used to use pine, white pine for sides. You know, I made many skiffs with white pine sides, slab sawn, 12 inch wide boards. You know, you're not going to get that quartered. You know, you get bottom planking quartered because it's narrower, you know. Uh, I've done yellow pine sides, redwood, mahogany. There's all kinds of material that can be used. Most of it is about the grain selection in the material that you do use. So I would just uh, make sure that you do a little bit more research on it and uh, think it over very carefully. Pick out the right wood and you're off and running. Now I got a comment from Chewy Dog. 
Lou, not only are all your videos exceptional and very educational, personally I find it a joy not only to watch and learn, but also to see a young man learning the art of being a shipwright. Well, I always thought that would be interesting to an audience to watch somebody learn. You know, in my videos I try to teach people through the video, and that's obviously what's going on. But uh, I obviously have to teach people in person, you know, to help to get the work done. And it's really helpful. I mean, I need help doing a lot of these projects. It's great to have somebody on the other end. And it's great to have a young guy that's uh, physically strong and polite and all these different things. So uh, I really enjoy having help. And uh, we're going to hang on and keep teaching them. And uh, you guys can keep watching. So uh, the next one I've got here is uh, Silver Channel. Dear Lou, do you preserve these molds after building? Enjoy in your videos. Well, yes, I do. I wouldn't throw these away for anything. Uh, these were made, like I had said before, to be a production set of molds. So you could build multiple, multiple dories over this, and you could build it in different ways. You could build a plywood dory over it. You know, you can build a lap straight dory over it. You could notch them and build it, uh, you know, on battens uh, so it was smooth planked and glassed over. Oh man, you could do all kinds of different things with it. I'm actually going to build it with uh, a kind of a composite bottom and gobbets, and then it's going to go into a traditional build lap straight construction from there to the shear. And I'm actually going to bend frames, and it isn't going to have the traditional frame in it a dory like this would have. So. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Now John Reynolds has asked me a question that I get quite often. Lou, how is the log priced? Do you pay for the board feet you drive out with? It's two different questions. I do pay for the board footage that I drive out with. You know, I put a log up on the mill. We haven't scaled the log. We don't know how many board feet are in it. There's certain types of lumber that I'm looking for, certain widths and lengths and different things. And I asked the sawyer to saw that log into those pieces. They have to be acceptable to me the way it's being priced. So I'm only paying for acceptable lumber for what I want to use it for. And then you pay a premium for that because, you know, that is very, very nice lumber. And uh, it's long, it's wide. A lot of it is quartered because it's center cut. It's cut right down the middle of the log so you get quartered lumber on both sides, although the whole log is not quartered. It's kind of slab sawn or what I call center cut. Now. You could buy it, I could price the log. I could pay for it run of the mill and buy a log and just say, look, I want you to saw it into this and uh, you know, maybe half of the log would be good and the other half wouldn't be good. Who knows what might happen? I don't get to see it first. So there's different ways to buy it and different ways to price it. Now, I'm paying you know, as much as $6 a board foot for lumber like you see right there. Really, really nice lumber. If I was buying something shorter and narrower or something that's kind of a, a, what I would call live, which would be curved, you know, which isn't really useful to everybody, although it's useful for planking, I might pay $4 a board foot for it. So it varies. Now Weaver Lily has sent me this. Lou, really loving the series as I did the previous workboat skiff. Well, thank you really a lot for that because uh, uh, it's nice to know that people like the stuff that we do. I think that this particular series on this boat right here is going to be more interesting than that, really, and cover a lot more different styles of work, so it's pretty cool. The question is, why not build the dory clinker style? Well, it's going to be built clinker style. Uh, wouldn't that be simpler, or is this more a matter of tradition for dory construction to have flush planks? Well. It's not going to have flush planks. Maybe it's because of the way the molds are set up here that you may be uh, led to believe that, but actually uh, the planks are going to overlap each other. The garbed planks will be put on first, the next plank overlaps that, the next one plank overlaps that, and they're fastened together along the seams. So what you've got is clinker style right there. I call it lap strake. I used to call it lap strake. Clinker was actually a new term to me not that many years ago. We used to always call it lap straight. But dories are built this way, and uh, I suppose you could build them some other way, but uh, this is the way it's done right here, and that's the way we're going to do it. Now, Clock Crolius is looking for a little bit more information on the false bottom and the bent frames. 
Well, it is going to have a false bottom on it made of plywood, three layers of three-eighths plywood, and it's really an aid to building the rest of it. It has nothing to do with the boat itself when it's done. The bottom for the boat will be laid up on top of that bottom, and uh, it's going to be made of layers. It's actually the, the real bottom is going to be uh, what you'd call composite construction. It's going to be a three-eighths inch layer of wood, not plywood. Uh, it's going to have the garbage plank connected to it, then it's going to have some carbon fiber put over it and wet it out, then it's going to have another layer of plank and put over that. So it's going to be kind of a new technique on the bottom right here, and then it's going to shift over to traditional style planking from there up. Uh, it'll be cedar plank, lap straight, like I said, and yes, it will have bent frames in it. It's not going to have any of the traditional dory frames made out of like larch knees or anything like that. It's going to have bent frames in it afterwards, yes. Now Ben Souther has asked, I'm thinking of turning a couple of caulking hammers for our shop. Do you have any tips as to type of wood, sounding holes, etc.? Well, you know, I really have never made any caulking hammers. But, uh, and so I don't have any advice on sounding holes or those slots in the head, but apparently they have an effect on the sound because I have different caulking hammers that do sound a lot different. Most of the caulking hammers that I've seen are made of mesquite, which is a real hard wood to split. It's kind of like an interlock uh, and grain. And uh, I've seen a few uh, that were made in this area out of what they call hop hornbeam. And that's not to be confused with horn beam, but hop horn beam. Very, very solid wood that you can make heads of mallets out of or chisel handles or anything like that. And uh, the next question I've got here is uh, from Chris Cunicelli. Lou, I've noticed that you like electric planes. Yes, I do. Uh, I'm a hand tool enthusiast, so I'm curious. Uh, if you use a lot of hand planes in your work. Also, what are the advantages of the electric plane? Well, I do use a lot of hand planes in my work, and I'm talking about a lot of hand planes. You know, I use a block plane for all kinds of different things, and I use a lot of rabbit planes in my work to get at different places that you just can't get to with other things. And uh, the electric planes, I mean, I live with electric planes in my hand. There's no question about it. They, they just accomplish work that hand planes cannot do at all, have no chance of doing, so there's no comparison whatsoever. You know, I mean, I can take a twisted piece of white oak a foot wide and flatten it right out, you know, take a, a two-inch piece of oak and make it into a one-by with electric plane in my hand in no time flat. There's no comparison. So, yes, I love electric planes, and uh, I'll always have one in use for sure. Now, here's another one from Andrew Roth. Louis, I'm a draftsman by trade, and watching you sketch this boat was one of the most impressive things I've seen in a long time. Well, thank you for that, but uh, let's go on to the question here. You are able to capture design intent that would be difficult in modern parametric CAD software. That being said, have you ever used CAD software to make your drawings or work from them? Well, no, I have never used CAD software. I really don't know much about it, but I have seen it used, and I'll tell you what, it's incredibly impressive, but, uh, you know, in a small shop environment like this, I don't have access to that type of stuff, and it's expensive and those kinds of things, and, uh, you know, it's still available, you know, to draw on paper. You know, I think uh, the thing is, is that the most important part of all of it really is to have it in your head properly first. Then you can get it into CAD software, uh, you know, I can get it onto a drawing board, and that's what I do. That's always been, uh, you know, a fail-safe uh, way to go, and uh, I'm familiar with it. Uh, my projects aren't huge, and uh, that's the way I do it. So, uh, you know, I would like to know more about uh, parametric CAD software and get an opportunity to work with somebody that uh, works with it, because it's impressive. Now, Jeff Benton writes, Will Lou be publishing the plans for the Total Boat Works GIF? Well, yes, I will, and they're going to be available very shortly. It's going to be a real nice, extensive set of plans. It'll have all the lumber list in it. And uh, the other thing we do is actually we build work skiffs on order, and we actually sell materials to build work skiffs and dories and things like that. I sell cedar for the sides and oak for gunnels and, and chines and structural members and different things like that. So I take orders for lumber, 
and I source lumber for different people. The other thing that's going to happen very shortly is we're going to have the lines drawings to the total boat sport dory available, and uh, that's not going to be long at all either. They're complete right now. Uh, the the uh, actual working drawings for building it are not quite complete. I'm still kind of working on it in my mind a little bit, but uh, as soon as that's done, they're going to be available too. Now, that completes our question and answer video, and uh, I just want to tell you that our next video is going to be working on the false bottom that's connected to the jig and is part of the jig. That's the last piece that we have to do uh, building the jig before we get started actually putting the dory together.